her name was Babylon. Revelation 17, 5 says upon her forehead was a name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And the abominations of this earth. But in Revelation 18, the Bible says that before Jesus comes, there's going to be one message that goes to the world. Revelation 18, beginning and verse 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, remember now, Babylon's the horse, the whore, Babylon is the false church. It says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The Bible says these churches have become holding of the devil. But notice, he still has the people in these churches. The Bible says in verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. But I heard another voice, the Bible says. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her who? My people. Now notice, they're in Babylon. Notice, they're in the false church. Notice, every church has become a cage, an habitation of devils, and yet God goes into them and says, come out of her, not the devil's people, my people. Jesus has many children in every denomination, in every religion. Some are not even going to church. They're in the street selling drugs somewhere. They're on the corner somewhere that everybody's given up on, that when they hear this truth, God is going to identify them because God's sheep hear his voice and they follow him. And I'm telling you, you seven Adventists who were born and raised seven Adventists and are claiming to be seven Adventists, you better check yourself. Because you must understand this Bible-believing church, the Seventh Adventist Church teaches that we believe that our bodies are the temple of the Holy God. That we don't just put anything in these bodies. We believe that this body is to manifest itself. We're to give glory to God in the simplicity of modest dress. This church, they believe in the Bible that they don't wear jewelry. They don't even need a wedding band. The Bible says that the true wedding band is the husband. The house band. You see, God is going to have a people of simplicity that throw it all off, just like Jesus when he laid down his glory. When he took on the form of a servant. Now, we don't need to be talking now. Just now, someone is getting ready to make a decision. And every one of us, I don't care who we are, we are going to have to choose whether we're going to follow God or whether we're going to follow man. Jesus is about to come. You must make sure that everything you believe is from the Bible. Jesus must be the center of your life. You must understand that God's people will keep the commandments of God. You must believe in that gift of prophecy. You know, there's some that say, oh, I'm a seven day Adventist. But I don't believe in the writings of that prophet. But brothers and sisters, the Bible says that that true church, it must have the gift of prophecy. And you know what that prophet said? For those of you who know what I'm talking about. That prophet in a book called Testimonies to Minister said, not one penny should be spent for a circle of gold to testify your merit. It says that that which is going to be true is the relationship between the husband and the wife, which is in the sight of God of great price. And God is going to have a people, not everybody, but he's going to have a remnant. You know what a remnant means? You know what a remnant means? It's only going to be a few. Matthew 7, it says the world, the majority of them are going down a road that is leading to destruction. And it says many be they go out this broad, everything you want to do, you can go down that road. But it says that there's going to be a little road, a narrow road, and only a few are going to make it. You see, brothers and sisters, the majority of people in this world, they love everything else 
more than they love Jesus. And if you will search your heart, and if you see anything that is in your life that the Bible does not say should be there, and you are not willing to let go of that thing, do you know that thing becomes your God? That thing becomes your idol and separates between you and Jesus. But God is going to have a people. Just like you see there when you get home, read Revelation 12 and verse 17. That false woman, she was decked with all the ornaments, but the true woman, she only had that which was natural and true beauty. She was not wearing that artificial adornment. And God is going to have a people in these last days that says, Jesus, whatever you say, I will do. In fact, in John 10, notice what the Bible says as we get ready to bring this message to a close. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether we eat, whether we drink, or whatsoever we do, we must do all to the glory of God. Whether it's in diet or in dress, whether it's in education or in music, whether it's in the way we spend our time or our money, whatever we do, it must be built on the Word of God. Somebody says, I can do this, and I say, where's the text? They say, well, I don't know, but I can do it anyway. That's not a Bible-believing Christian. We must prove what is acceptable to God. And if we love Jesus, we don't want to do what the world is doing. We want to do what pleases Christ. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 15. And the reason is simply this. When you yield step by step to the ways of the world, you come to view matters in nearly the same light so that when the national Sunday law is brought, you will be willing to accept the mark of the beast. I read what a prophet wrote. The time is not far distant. When the test will come to every soul, the mark of the beast will be urged upon us and those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will not find it a hard thing to yield to the powers that be. Rather than subject themselves to derision, to insult, to threaten imprisonment and death, the contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. In this time, the gold will be separated from the dross. In the church, godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that I have admired for brilliance will then go out in darkness. Many a pastor, many an evangelist, Many a member of this church for long years who have never developed a relationship with Jesus to live by the word of God and the word of God only are going to go out in darkness. The Bible says there's going to be a great shaking. And the only way that God is going to identify who is his, you know how he's going to know? John 10. John 10 beginning in verse 14, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16 says, Other sheep I have, which what? Are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. There are going to be people in every churches, but I must bring them. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold, one church. And one shepherd. Well, how are you going to know are you yours, Lord? Verse 26. But ye believe me not, because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep. Wherever denomination they are, my sheep. Hear my voice. And how do you know them, Jesus? I know them. And they follow me. Oh, brothers and sisters, tonight, this afternoon, somebody needs to make a decision. Today, should probation have closed, many of us, even who would claim to be seven Adventists, would have been lost because we have the name, but we don't have the experience with Jesus. 
And God is looking over his church today and says, how many are going to stop playing games with God? How many are going to take the teaching serious? How many are going to follow everything that Jesus has said to do? You see, the world, they don't understand right now, but God is getting some people ready. In fact, I'll read this to you as we close. I picked this out of, the, out of a little book called Review and Error. Some of you know where that is. And I got an old issue from 1945, October 4th. And listen to what that remnant church of God said in 1945. It says, We entreat our dear people to guard well their social and recreational activities, remembering that the mere amusement is the idle wasting of empty hours. Surely no one, how many? Surely no one preparing for the coming of Jesus will be found at the theater, the carnival, the movie house, the opera, the circus, the dance, the car table, or in attendance at commercialized sports, public recreational activities unless under careful Christian supervision are frequently employed by Satan and destroying souls. And the choice of attire we appeal to Christian manhood and womanhood for dignity, avoiding extravagance and flashiness, extreme fashions and fads, very low necks, short sleeves and short skirts fail to accord with Christian standards. Satan is constantly devising some new style of dress, and he exalts when his professed Christians equally, eagerly accept the fashions he has invented. It says... Remembering that our bodies are the temples of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let there be no artificial aids to change, detract, disfigure, or discolor the handiwork of the Creator. Neither will the true Christian desire to adorn the person with jewelry. Now, if you're here and you didn't know this, we studied this from the Bible. And we show from the Bible that God's people are going to leave the artificial alone and accept the true. And I showed you that if you didn't understand this, God doesn't condemn you. But when you study the Bible, it says that the true Christian will lay it all aside. It says, neither will the true Christian desire to adorn the person with jewelry. And in lands where the custom is not obligatory, no circle of gold should be worn as a testimony to marriage vows. This is what the church believes. But in the last days, this church has changed some of the ideas in which it is believed. And the Bible says that should God change? He says, I'm the Lord, I'll change not. He is going to have a people that are going to stand upon the authority of the word of the living God. Now, everybody's not going to do it. But there's going to be a remnant that will stand upon the authority of the words of Jesus. And somebody says, evangelist. Nobody is going to accept standards so high. And I say, you're deceived. I've seen it as I've gone from nation to nation, as I've gone from state to state. I have seen those that when they saw it for themselves, they said, I never knew that the Bible said the doorman should not be worn. They saw it for themselves and they took it all off. They said, I never knew the body was the temple of God. But when they saw it for themselves, there are Christians there are people of God that said everything Jesus says. You know what the problem is? It's not that the standards are too high. The problem is that our love is too low. You see, if we love Jesus, whatever he says, we want to do. And we say, Lord, whatever you say, we want to be ready for your coming. And brothers and sisters, I believe that there are some people in this room today that say, Lord, I've been playing games with God. Lord, I know that my life is not in harmony with the Bible. That should I have died today, I would have been lost. You may be an elder. You may be a minister. You may be a member. You may be a visitor. It doesn't matter where you are, but you're looking and you're examining your heart and you're saying, look, I'm not ready. 
You know Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a master in Israel. He was a teacher. And Jesus said, you need to be born again. I wonder if Jesus came in this room today, how many of us, when they look at and we think on the outward, we look good, we're fine, we love the Lord. And I wonder how many Jesus would say, I never knew you. Some in that day are going to say, Lord, but I did this. I prophesied. I, I, and Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. I promise you, if you spend more time in the television, if you spend more time on cell phones and in shopping, hours, and then a minister preaches and he goes by what we think, we're ready to run home. Do you think you're ready for the coming of Jesus? Jesus is about to come. I'm going to prove it tonight. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't know how much more plain to tell you that if ever we need to make a decision to not look around and to stop playing games with God, but today to say, Lord, I'm one of your sheep. I'm going to hear your voice and I don't care what else. I'm going to follow, not a man, but I'm going to follow the words of Jesus. The story is told of a father. And he had a rough life. He lost his wife. He became an alcoholic. He blamed all of his troubles on God. When he raised his daughter, he raised her without God. And he told his daughter that all of the problems that we have is because of the man upstairs. And his daughter didn't know any better. She was trained and raised that way. But as she grew older, one particular time a series of meetings started at one of the local churches that she passed by on her way home from school. And as she came home on her way from school, one of the Bible workers that was inviting about some of the meetings said, we're getting ready to have a series of meetings. Would you please come? Now, I don't know where we are, but if we're somewhere out there, maybe in the back or some other room and we're talking, please, Jesus is speaking to us. Every one of us needs to be saved. Please listen. Please listen. And that girl, she took one of the flyers and she remembered her father said that God was no good. And she didn't know what to do. She put it in the bag. She went home. And every day, day by day, she went by, she kept seeing that Bible worker, kept inviting her. We still have meetings. It's not far from your house. You can come if you want. One day, she said, you know what? I'm just going to go see what it's like. I know what my father said, but I'm going to go and see what it's like. So she didn't tell her father where she was going. She simply snuck out of the house and went to the meetings. The father was a drunk. He normally didn't even worry about what she did. But she went to the meetings. And when she went out to the meetings, she heard about the story of redemption. She heard about the love of Jesus, how God could take a sinner and make him a saint. And she says, maybe my father doesn't know how good God is. He doesn't know that God is a God of love. He loves us. Maybe I should invite my father. And so after a few days of checking out the meetings, she went back home and after a while, the father started missing her. You know, she was normally home at a certain time, and he didn't see her. So one day he came to her, and he said, Daughter, you're normally home doing this and that in your room, but I don't see you now between this hour, 7 and 9, or whatever the time was. And, and the daughter said, Yes, you're right. I've been going to a, a little church down the road, and they've been teaching about the Bible. And the face became shocked. He said, But Dad, I know what you think. You think that he caused all these problems, but whoever that person was, he showed us from the Bible, God's book, that God is a God of love. He's not the one that caused us to have all these problems. God is a God of love. I know you don't understand it, but Dad, I want you to come in here too. The Father says, no. God is the reason why we're in the condition we're in today. He said, please, don't go back to those meetings anymore. The little girl went back to her room and she began to ponder in her mind what she was going to do. After a while, she thought for a moment, she says, if that God is so good, like he said. And their minister read one time that they ought to be God rather than man. And that daughter made up her mind she was going to go back to those meetings. She would try to get back and do everything that she needed to do in the house, so she kept going to the meetings. And for a while, everything seemed fine. The father came home drunk like he always was, didn't miss her. But it would begin to come down to the end of those meetings. And the minister was getting ready to make an appeal for baptism. 
And the little girl, as she came out to the meeting, she came home one particular day after the minister made a call for baptism. And she was thinking, what should I do? I know my father wouldn't want me to do this. And when she came into her home, her father was there. He was waiting for her. And as the father came into her house, he said, where have you been? And she says, I... He said, where have you been? She says, well, I was at those meetings you told me not to go to. Anger rose up in her father's face. He said, I thought I told you not to go. And he said, listen, very sternly. He says, don't go to those meetings again. Drunk, beer on his breath. He said, if you go to those meetings again, I'm going to kill you. The girl was shook. She wondered, what should she do? She looked and she said, my father, he was drunk. He looked serious. And so that woman went into prayer, that young girl. She said, Lord, I need your strength. I need your help. She went back out and she determined in her mind that no matter what, she was going to those meetings. She said, I must obey God rather than man. That girl went out to the meeting. The minister made an appeal for baptism. And he kind of could almost see what was going on in the home. And she stood up to be baptized. She made her decision. And the minister said, we're going to have a baptism a few days from now. And he got everybody ready for the baptism. And that girl was so excited. She gave her heart to Jesus. And she goes home. But when she opened the door, guess who was waiting right in that, hall, in that front door? Her father. He was drunk, terribly drunk. Beer still in his hand. Forty to the side. He was there drunk. It looked like a demon was in his eyes. And he looked at her and he said, tell me, where have you been? That girl, she couldn't speak. She knew her dad was drunk. She knew he was serious. She knew that if she answered, she could pay with her life. She thought for a moment. She pleaded with God. And she made up in her mind. She would love not her life, even to the death. And she looked into her father. And she says, Father, I know what you think, but God is a God of love. I went to those meetings. And I'm going to get baptized. The father's fear and anger rose up. And he said, what? And raised his hand back and slapped her as hard as he could. That girl shook and flew across the room and hit the edge of the countertop and her head burst open, blood oozed out everywhere. And by that time, there's a knock on the door. A knock on the door and all of a sudden the door broke open and it was the Bible worker. He had understood what was going on, and he wondered and to, wanted to make sure that that girl was all right. He was going to try to talk to the family, and when he gets in, he sees a little girl there in the pool of blood. He looks at the father. The father's drunk. The father now is almost like he's lost his mind. He don't know what's going on. And the man comes in and says, we need to call the ambulance. So he says, call 911, and they call 911, calling for the ambulance. And the little girl's there lying on the ground. She calls her father over, and her father's there. She calls the Bible worker over, he's there, and they're saying everything's going to be all right. And that little girl, blood, continued to ooze out upon her dress all over her body. She says, listen, I don't have much longer, but I want you to promise that you'll give me one request, that you'll fulfill one request for me. And the Bible worker said, no, you're going to be all right. Ambulance is coming. You're going to be all right. Don't talk like that. You're going to be all right. She says, listen, I don't have much time. Please promise me you'll fulfill my one last request. And he kept trying to plead with her. She said, please. Would you just feel one last request? And they say, well, you're not going to die, but, but, but just to comfort you, yes, whatever you want, we'll do it. And she says, will you promise me one thing? And they say, okay, what, what is it? She said, will you promise me that you will bury me in this dress? Bury me in this dress. And they look at her and say, bury you in this dress? She says, promise me. They said, you're not going to die, but we promise you. That little girl of peace came over her face. She looked at her father and said, I love you. 
The father now doesn't know what's going on. They look back and forth, and, and the man, the Bible worker says, but, but I'll do this, but please tell me, why do you want me to bury you in that dress? And that little girl, she looked at her father. She looked at the Bible worker. She looked at the father. She looked back at the Bible worker, and she says, listen, Jesus, sacrifice all and shed his blood for me. When in the resurrection morning I wake up, I want to be able to look at my God and his face and say, Lord, you shed your blood for me. I shed my blood for you too. You see, when you have enough love, any sacrifice is easy. And I believe that there's some people in this room that says, Lord, you love me so much, you gave up everything. Heaven was not a place to be desired as long as we were lost. And he gave up a good place to save us, no good sinners. What can we hold on? What in this world is worth holding on that we won't give up for Jesus? What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You can tell a man that does not know Jesus that the standards are too high, but you can't tell me who loves Jesus. You can't tell a man who has found the love of God that any sacrifice is too great. Oh, they'll love not their lives to the death. And I believe that there are some people here, some young men, some young women, some older men, some older women, some families that says, Lord, I'm not ready. I know my life. Your head's about, your eyes are closed, and you're examining your own heart. You're not looking around. Right now, you're saying, Lord, am I ready for the coming of Jesus? And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you this decision. The devil is going to do everything he can not to make you decide for Jesus now. You see, now is the only time that we have promised. Tomorrow's not promised. Getting home is not promised. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. There's someone here today that came this morning that knows that they're not ready for the coming of Jesus. You know what's in your CD collection. You know that rap music is not going to heaven. You know that the DVDs that are in your home, that if God would come to your home, you would try to hide those DVDs. You know that if God would open up your refrigerator, you would say, Lord, forgive me, that should not be there. You know that what you watch on television, you know that the thoughts, the secret sins that are in your mind that no one else knows about, you know that when God looks at you, he sees it all. And you know that you don't know Jesus. And I'm going to prove that this world as we know it is coming to an end. And you say, Lord, I want to be saved. What do I do? Jesus says, repent and be baptized. Is there someone here today that says, Lord, I want to follow Jesus all the way. I want to be ready. I want my sins to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. I want salvation today. I want to be a part of God's true church. If there's someone like that here today, would you just raise your hand? Praise God. If you raise your hand, would you just slip out of your seat and come forward? If you raise your hand and you want to be baptized, you want to be born again into God's remnant church, get up out of your seat. Don't be ashamed of God. God is not ashamed for you. Get up and walk down this aisle and come forward and say, Lord, I want to follow Jesus. There's some more people that are in the seats. If you took your stand yesterday, and you took your stand yesterday and you want to be baptized, will you just please stand up and come forward? And if there's someone else that says, Lord, I want to go all the way with Jesus. You know, somebody talked to me yesterday. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I want to show you something as we close. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, praise God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, you know, somebody said to me the other day. They said, Pastor, praise God. They said, I've been baptized before, Pastor. They said, I've been baptized before. Do you know that I know of people that have been baptized over four times? But do you know that the Bible says that there's only one baptism? Did you know that? Look at what the Bible says. In Ephesians 4, the Bible says in verses 4 and 5, it says, There's one body, one church, one spirit, even as you call. Verse 5 says, one Lord, one faith. How many baptisms? One baptism. 
Do you know that a man could be baptized six times and heaven say you haven't been baptized once? You see, there's only one baptism. You see, baptism is a symbol that you've been born again. And there's people that have gone down into the water, dry devils, and have come back up wet devils. The literal water doesn't change you. And if you have been baptized, but your life is no different. If you're living and watching the same things, doing the same things as the world has done, the Bible says, even if you've been baptized six times, you haven't even been baptized once. There's only one baptism. And there's someone in this room today that has been baptized before, but they know that their life does not reflect the God of heaven. And today you're saying, Lord, I need to be born again. Today, I need to go down into the watery grave so that when Jesus comes, I'll be ready to meet him. Praise God. Is there someone else, as we get ready to close this meeting, is there someone else that says, Lord, I want to go all the way with Jesus. I don't care what the world is doing, I promise you. There will be many people right now in these seats. There are many that are sitting down in the seats. So they're convicted in their hearts. And you want to move, but you're saying, what will people think? I'm a minister, I'm a pastor, I'm an elder, I'm this, I'm that. Well, Jesus says that except the man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I don't care who it is. But if you recognize that you're not ready, everybody knows we are, we're not fooling God, we're fooling ourselves. When we come to church and we just play games with God, you know how many people who are in the right church are going to be lost because they've been playing games with Jesus. While there are going to be many from these other denominations that when they hear the Bible truth, these other sheep and other churches, they say, that's the truth. I see it in the Bible. I'm going to do it. And they accept it. While members who have grown up in this church who will play games with God, oh, I'm not going to take this off. Oh, I'm not going to do this. Well, the general conference said it's all right. Well, who is the general conference if they're not in harmony with the words of Jesus? God says we must obey God rather than man. And God is going to have a people, not everybody, but he's going to have a remnant. that are going to say, Lord, you sacrifice everything for me. And I'm going to give everything for you. Is there one more? I'm closing. Is praise God, sister. Is there one more? Praise the Lord that says, I hear Jesus speaking to me. Oh, brothers and sisters, you must understand. I'm getting ready to leave, but Jesus is still here. And you are going to have to decide. You know, somebody's going to say, that evangelist, he's too strict. Don't listen to what that evangelist said. But brothers and sisters, all I said was right in this word. Show me one thing that's not been in this word. You see, brothers and sisters, God is going to have those, praise the Lord, of this army. He's going to have those that say, I am going to walk all the way. And he's going to know them because my sheep, he says, they're going to hear my voice and follow. Oh, brothers and sisters, while on others thou art calling, oh, please, don't let God pass you by. The sad reality is that when people study the Bible, that when you look from Genesis to Revelation, the majority of the people have always been wrong. Did you know that? In the days of the flood, there were only eight souls that were saved. The rest of the world were destroyed. In Sodom and Gomorrah, only that family of Lot made it out. In the time of Jesus, the whole church and nation, the majority rejected him. And there were only a remnant each time. And in the last days, there will be no different. Even in this church, this is some of the last opportunities that God has given to the members here. This world is about to end. You're not understand do you know the gas prices i'm going to show you what it means old brothers and sisters this is it the national sunday law is about to be passed the time of trouble is about to break and everything is ready but us the people of god and jesus when he looked at his church in jerusalem he said oh jerusalem Oh, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Oh, I would have shown you what's about to take place, but now they're hid from your eyes. You're surrounded. You don't even know it. It's going to come upon this generation. 
And while people have time for their work, you know somebody says, oh, I can't come out to those, those meetings, and they go over an hour to go to work every morning. What shall it profit a man? You're going to have to stand before the judgment bar of God. And instead of seeing me, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see an angel who is standing there saying, won't you get ready? Won't you accept me before it's too late? Is there one more? It says, Lord, he's speaking to me. I'm resisting, but Lord, now I surrender all. Is there just one more? Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, I've been praying for some specific faces in this room that are even here tonight, today. If I were you, I would close my eyes. If you're serious, I don't care if you're in the mother's room or in the side room or up listening to the projection. I don't care where we are, even playing the piano. I would say to myself, Lord, do you want me to be born again? What a shame it would be for probation to close, for Jesus to come, and for us to be lost. For us to be lost. Is there one more? I'm going to close. But I'm going to ask, is there simply one more that says, Lord, he's speaking to me. I don't care how many sins there are. If we come to Jesus, he can wash them in the blood of the Lamb. Any addiction, praise God, he can break. Any problem, he can solve. Praise the Lord. Is there just one more? That he's speaking to me. Just one more. You know, brothers and sisters, if God, if we really knew the love that was in the heart of God, all heaven would be excited about one thing, and that's people being born again. Heaven, you know, heaven will wait a thousand years if some soul could be saved. But the reason why probation is going to be closed is because every man would have made up his mind. And even if there were a thousand more years, we would still love sin more than we love Jesus. Many are going to be like that rich young ruler. And they're going to want to give their hearts to Jesus. And Jesus is going to say, well, you have to sacrifice all that you have. And that rich young ruler, he wanted to do it. But the Bible says he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. There were things he wasn't willing to give up. And so he left Jesus and he's lost. Not one of us has to be like that in this room today. Is there one that says, Lord, I've been playing. But now I surrender all to Jesus. I'm serious now and I'm closing. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Just slip out of your seat and come forward, please. You know, brothers and sisters, I don't want to close, but I'm closing. We're going to have a baptism. We're going to have a baptism today. And those who have taken their decision, many of them are going to be able to go down in the grave and wash all their sins away. If you know that you need to be a part of that baptism, you need to be born again, please make your decision just now. I'm closing. Father, Lord, I would tarry longer. But you're telling me now that we need to close this, this decision. And it's so sad, Lord, that many will wait until it's too late. It was when the Noah's Ark was closed that the ones who didn't take Jesus serious, they were caught up in the things of this world, that when the rain started, they knocked on the door of that ark, but it was too late. Oh, Lord, please be with those that are sitting that are struggling now, and they know they're struggling because they're saying, Lord, they're thinking about how many excuses of why they don't need to be born again. They're talking about communion and this thing and that. But in your heart, the Holy Spirit is saying, no, 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 no. You need to be born again. If God is speaking to you, no matter who you are, please forget this audience, forget this congregation, and just slip out of your seat and say, Lord, all to Jesus I surrender. I want to be ready for the coming of Christ. Oh, Father, be with the souls just now that have made the decision. The greatest 
decision in the world. Wash them in the blood of the Lamb. Whatever addictions that is in their minds and hearts and lives, I pray upon the authority of your word that you will break it by the blood of Jesus. For you said that they shall know the truth and the truth shall make them free and that when Jesus sets us free, that we're free indeed. Oh Lord, be with every soul that is taking their stand, young and old. Be with the families, Lord. Be with those who should have stood but are resisting your influence. Please help them to decide before it is too late. And I pray, Lord, that as we get ready to go into the watery grave, that each person who has made this decision today will know that no matter how terrible their life has been in the past, that because of the blood of Jesus, that all of it is cast into the depths of the sea, that they may begin a new life, even the life of faith, and that we might be ready to meet you. Oh, Father, keep us. And I'm just so thankful for what you have done today, Lord, and for your saving grace. And we're thankful for your true church, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.